So individual lawyers and individual plaintiffs who are brave and stand up can affect change and even the trillion dollar corporations in America and that's a unique thing about our legal system is that the little guy gets his voice there whereas the little guy can't buy lobbyists and can't buy policy changes in DC but we do have a great system in America where judges are able to uh, impose some rational um, uh, limits on runaway uh, monopolies. I mean, Dylan, great to have you on American Thought Leaders. And of course, we're doing the fist pump. We know there's coronavirus in the US. Um, we don't know if it's here, but better be safe than sorry. So, of course, we have to talk about the First Amendment. I mean, this is one of your, your big, big issues. And so what are you thinking about right now? What are some of the, the cases you're involved in? First Amendment issues regarding freedom of speech are really impacting every level of American society. So over the last couple of years, lawsuits that I've been involved in as a trial lawyer have included suing the University of California, Berkeley for refusing to allow a conservative student organization to bring conservative speakers to the campus. I sued the city of San Clemente for refusing to allow uh, citizens to come to city council meetings and complain about homelessness issues like they were doing uh, before the mayor decided to shut that down. Um, we successfully resolved both of those lawsuits in favor of free speech. Uh, less successful in suing the online entities that are trying to suppress our free speech. So for example, last year uh, my firm was local counsel suing Twitter on behalf of a Canadian uh, radical feminist who uh, disagrees with transgender activists requirement that the gender pronouns of choice necessarily be used online and she was, uh, Megan Murphy was removed from Twitter for that. We've right. sued Twitter uh, to try to enforce Twitter's terms of service which do not ban the conduct for which she was removed and uh, the company has invoked the successful strategy that all these online companies have used, uh, Communications Decency Act Section 230 yes. to block even the enforcement of normal consumer laws of breach of contract and uh, false advertising. So we, we're appealing that case right now. But what that comes up against is similar to the uh, Prager University case that some of your uh, viewers may have seen, yes, is course. that uh, there have been some attempts by people on uh, the free speech side to try to impose First Amendment requirements onto these private social media companies. And I don't really go that far in my analysis. I think that we don't want to penalize successful companies by effectively nationalizing them and requiring them to adhere to the same standards as the government. At the same time, when a company is making promises in its terms of service to its users that will have an open and welcoming platform using objective criteria on what speech is permitted and what is not, but then it allows social media uh, activists from a far, right, far left fringe to essentially dictate content on these platforms and get people deplatformed and removed for their speech. Um, we feel like they're violating their promises to consumers in their contracts as well as their advertising. And so we think that Communications Decency Act 230, which was originally meant to allow these social media platforms and internet providers to allow people to talk to each other without being liable for the speech on there, they've now taken that too far and effectively allowed it as a shield to prevent the same laws that apply to every other company from applying to those companies. So that's kind of a big issue right now. Well, this is, this is the question. I've been discussing with, this, with a number of people recently. I mean, yes, Facebook and yes, Google are private companies, but they're so giant in the online space for so many people. I mean, they've effectively become a kind of public square. Sure. Right? So it, it, it can't be the same rules that apply in this sort of a context that would apply to, you know, every kind of reasonably sized company that's, you know, has some sort of reasonably sized impact, right, on, on society. But this is, I mean, major conversations are had. Twitter, right? Obvi the obvious one, right? The president speaks to the country through Twitter very often, right? Well, so. will he continue to be able to? I think that this is actually a very interesting area of potentially election interference, where you have big social media companies that are censoring one side of a political race and not the other side. I think that is uh, potentially an in-kind contribution. So Laura Loomer, who is running for Congress in Florida, has actually brought a lawsuit like this because Laura Loomer has been kicked off of Twitter. Right. She's a you know prominent critic of the left. 
And her opponent is not off of Twitter, so her opponent is effectively allowed to have free reign over there while she's not. Is that an in-kind contribution by Twitter to her opponent? It's a very novel legal theory. Um, we have uh, historically in the United States have these standards that require equal time on the traditional broadcast networks. Right. Which And the theory there was there's a limited spectrum of bandwidth and so we have to sort of police making sure both sides are heard. Well, there isn't a limited spectrum of bandwidth anymore. In fact, using digital technology, cable television, right. and the internet, the most popular uh, telecommunications uh, channels in the world are not on the broadcast networks. It's, you know, the top shows in America are actually all on Fox News, the news shows. And they're not limited, uh, net, you know, broadband. So it, it really, that same historical analysis doesn't really apply anymore. But I think we're in a sort of a, a wild, wild west. And one of the problems that we have here, to your point, is that there are two or three companies effectively, communi uh, effectively monopolizing with or, du or duopolizing the world's communications. And that poses antitrust issues. Right. So uh, you have one company, Google, that controls uh, the global phone uh, communications market, global browser, global search engine, and the top video search engine of YouTube. And there's no effective competition. And then those, uh, that platform also sells advertising. Well, if that platform sells advertising and it has a monopoly and then it decides unilaterally who can advertise and who cannot, it effectively drowns out competition, including its own competitors. And so, unfortunately, our United States Department of Justice has yet to take action on this uh, appropriately, in my opinion. And this is really squelching competition, squelching uh, alternative search engines, squelching uh, travel websites. It, it is a host of issues that, in fact, as we know, our antitrust laws are there to make sure that uh, consumer choice is maximum. And so. Oligopolies and monopolies ultimately uh, uh, end up with a rise of price for consumers. So um, they're getting away with it so far. Uh, hopefully the world, and interestingly, Europe is not allowing this. So right. Europe and the EU have definitely been more aggressive on antitrust enforcement, as well as uh, the theft of uh, data of users than the United States. So I think we need to really wake up here and see what's going on. Well, we, you know, we had the Texas AG, Ken Paxton, on. So there's, there is this kind of you know, deep interest. I think he said there's 51 of these attorney generals. So it's a very bipartisan issue, this interest in Google. And there's another AG, I think, that's leading the Facebook. Uh, so yes. similar numbers. Um, so there is, but you, you think this should be take, tackled at the federal level? Well, antitrust law is a federal issue. Right. And so also the federal laws in play include um, Communications Decency Act, yes. Section 230. That's a federal law. So there's, there are state antitrust um, uh, enforcement mechanisms, but they are sort of subservient to the federal one. So it really does require a federal organization and collaboration. Interesting. Are there any any particular these lawsuits that you're involved in you want to talk about, like just in general that, that you want to? Uh, get well, into a you know, bit? we had a uh, high-profile lawsuit against Google for discriminating against um, workers uh, on the basis of their political views, their gender, and their race. This is the James Damore lawsuit, yes. and uh, you know that lawsuit um, has uh, you know it's still ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, as a result of that lawsuit, we've seen some personnel and policy changes at Google. So Google seems to have become aware of some of the liabilities that occur as a result of its conduct in these issues. Uh, Google has had to agree to change its uh, confidentiality policies as, as a result of National Labor Relations Board action brought by one of our clients. And uh, so Google used to prevent its workers from talking to each other about their working conditions, which is banned by the National Labor Relations Act, and they've now changed those policies. So individual lawyers and individual plaintiffs who are brave and stand up can affect change in even the trillion dollar corporations in America. And that's the unique thing about our legal system is that the little guy gets his voice there, whereas the little guy can't buy lobbyists and can't buy policy changes in DC. But we do have a great system in America where judges are able to uh, impose some rational um, uh, limits on runaway uh, 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 
uh, monopolies. Well, and you and you seem to have been able to affect some. I mean, I, I, I think most people would argue positive change without having a conclusion of a lawsuit yet, which I think is extremely interesting. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Well, so Harmi Dillon, it's such a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you.